M S W Media. Big shout out today to Helix Sleep. Take their two-minute sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use promo code HELIXPARTNER. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. And this episode is sponsored by Lumi, a doctor-developed, skin-safe, pH-balanced, and aluminum-free deodorant. New customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code DAILYBEANS at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Monday, April 17th, 2023. Today, Evan Corcoran has quit working as Trump's lawyer on the Mar-a-Lago documents case. The Texas judge that is trying to ban the abortion pill, Mifepristone, failed to disclose information during his Senate confirmation. More Clarence Thomas failures to disclose. The January 6th rioter that crushed a Capitol police officer in a door has been sentenced. Fox admits it lied to the court. And nothing important happened with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I hope you enjoyed the episode of Jack that came out this weekend. And I hope patrons enjoyed the cleanup on aisle 45 bonus episode with me and Pete Strzok and the Beans Weekly Wrap Up. Also, if you're a patron, check your inbox uh, and check your junk mail for, for an email from us about a meet and greet that's happening in D.C. on April 30th. Also, during this episode, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Jessica Munoz about unionization at a Loma Linda medical facility. And Fox News has admitted that it lied to the court. It has submitted a formal apology to the court for misrepresenting Rupert Murdoch's role as an executive at Fox News. So I guess they're really sorry that they lied and got caught. And as I said in the intro, nothing happened with Mike Pompeo this week, although he won't be running for president, but nobody cares. Also, before we get to the hot notes, last Monday on April 10th, we learned that the Department of Justice was asking for 188 months in prison for the January 6th rioter McCooey that crushed Officer Hodges in a door. And I had a prediction. Let's listen to that clip. Prosecutors at the Department of Justice are seeking the longest sentence for a January 6th rioter, 188 months. This is the seditionist that smashed Officer Hodges in the doorway. And we remember, we all remember seeing that video. This would be the longest sentence handed down so far if they give 188 months, but it's Judge Trevor McFadden. And I imagine I'm going to say 90 to 94 months tops, if that, less than half of what the DOJ's max is in their ask in the sentencing memo. Well, Judge Trevor sentenced McCooey to, you guessed it, 90 months in prison. That's less than half of the recommendation. I was hoping I wouldn't be right, but I was exactly right. So he will be going to prison now for 90 months instead of the 188 recommended, which I think is a miscarriage of justice. But I guess that's what you get when you have Judge Trevor McFadden issuing the sentences. All right, we have a lot of news to get to. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. First up from Jacqueline Alemany at The Washington Post. One of former President Donald Trump's top lawyers on the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case is no longer working on the matter after he appeared before a federal grand jury last month. That's according to people familiar with the move. Now, this is Evan Corcoran, and he is still representing Trump in other cases, such as special counsel Jack Smith's probe into the January 6th attack on the Capitol. These people, by the way, spoke to The Washington Post on the condition of anonymity. Prosecutors investigating Trump's taking classified documents to his Mar-a-Lago club after leaving office won a court fight that allowed them to question Corcoran when judges ruled that he could not use attorney-client privilege to avoid disclosing information about his communications with Trump. They cited an exception to the legal principle 
that lawyers must keep confidential what they are told by their clients when there's evidence that the client used the attorney's legal services in furtherance of a crime. Remember, it doesn't have to be both people. It can be one-sided. One person can be doing the communication in furtherance of a crime. And uh, that's the crime fraud exception. And I also want to note it wasn't just testimony that they got pursuant to the crime fraud exception. They also got notes, handwritten notes from Corcoran, uh, along with notes about like transcriptions of audio, maybe perhaps phone calls and some invoices. Not sure what those invoices were for. But the Justice Department is increasingly focused on obstruction of justice by Trump in the investigation into the documents and whether Trump took steps to impede or directed others to impede government efforts to collect all the sensitive records. And Jack Smith has amassed a lot of evidence showing that that is the case. Investigators have questioned more than a dozen witnesses and obtained emails and text messages about the period between when the subpoena was received in May and when the FBI agents searched Mar-a-Lago in August and recovered over 100 documents that were still in Trump's possession. Quote, the legal team handling all matters involving the special counsel, myself, Jim Trusty, John Rowley, Lindsay Halligan, and Evan Corcoran is intact, and we continue to work closely with Evan as we do with the entire team to protect our client. That's Trump lawyer Tim Parlator in a statement without elaborating on Corcoran's role. Corcoran's lawyers declined to comment, and a Trump spokesman, Steve Chung, suggested the people confirming Corcoran's recusal were inaccurate but didn't provide any details. So we'll keep our eyes on this story and go into more detail on the Jack podcast next Sunday because the ethics rules in Virginia and D.C., for example, say that a lawyer only has, like, he can't represent the person at trial if that lawyer is also a witness. But they can and often do represent that client leading up to the trial. So... Corcoran at this point is not barred from representing Trump, but apparently had recused himself uh, for the testimony. And we'll see what happens. I don't know if he's going to come back or if he's going to stay away or if he's, you know, going to be a witness at trial uh, pursuant to the testimony that he gave or the notes that he turned over. We don't know any of that yet. So we'll keep our eye on this story. And like I said, we'll talk about it on Sunday on the episode of Jack. And the Supreme Court on Friday temporarily restored full access to a key abortion medication, giving itself more time to review a lower court decision that suspended approval of a pill used in more than half of all abortions in the United States. This was Justice Alito who granted the government's request for a stay. This is an administrative emergency stay until Wednesday and asked for additional time and additional briefing from the anti-abortion groups by next Tuesday. Now, this administrative stay does not forecast the court's ultimate disposition of the case, which returned the issue to the high court less than a year after a landmark decision that overturned Roe. The government and Danko Laboratories, the manufacturer of the drug Mifepristone, urged the court not to second-guess the expertise of the Food and Drug Administration, which relied on data from dozens of clinical trials when it approved the drug more than 20 years ago. Leaving the ruling in place, they said, will create confusion and uncertainty for abortion providers and have devastating consequences for the pharmaceutical industry's ability to bring new drugs to market. And as a lawyer for a conservative legal group, Matthew Kaczmarek, in early 2017, submitted an article to a Texas law review criticizing Obama-era protections for transgender people and for those seeking abortions. According to the draft article, he argued the Obama administration had discounted religious physicians who cannot use their scalpels to make female what God created male and, quote, cannot use their pens to prescribe or dispense abortifacient drugs designed to kill unborn children, unquote. But a few months after the piece arrived, an editor at the Law Journal who'd been working with Kazmarek received an unusual email citing, reasons I may discuss at a later date, Kazmarek, who had originally been listed as the article's sole author, said he would be removing his name and replacing it with those of two colleagues at his legal group. First Liberty Institute. That's according to emails and early drafts obtained by the Washington Post. A few months after this piece was written by him as the sole author, he emailed some folks and said, take my name off it and put these two people on it. What Kazimark did not say in the email was that he'd already been interviewed for a judgeship by his state's two senators and was awaiting an interview at the White House. As part of that process, he was required to list all of his published work on a questionnaire submitted to the Senate Judiciary Committee 
including books, articles, reports, letters to the editor, editorial pieces, or other published material you've written or edited. The article, titled The Jurisprudence of the Body, was published in September 2017 by the Texas Review of Law and Politics, a very right-leaning journal that Kazmarek had led as a law student at the University of Texas. But Kazmarek's role in the article was not disclosed to the Senate Judiciary, nor did he list the article on the paperwork he submitted to the Senate in advance of his confirmation hearings in which Kazimark's past statements on LGBT issues became a point of contention. Trump nominated Kazmarek to the federal bench in September 2017, the same month the article was published. But he took his name off of it and didn't tell the Senate Judiciary Committee that he wrote it. Now, during his confirmation hearing that December, a few months later, Democratic senators questioned Kazmarek extensively on his views on LGBTQ rights and abortion, issues at the heart of the article he submitted to the Law Journal. The journal article argues against a 2016 Department of Health and Human Services rule that forbid doctors to discriminate against patients who sought gender-affirming care or pregnancy termination. The rule from the Obama administration, the article says, should contain a conscientious objector exception. A law review article is exactly the kind of material the Senate Judiciary Committee is trying to gather in the judicial confirmation process because it provides a sense of the judge's personal opinions. So I, apart from impeachment or just being angry, I'm not sure what we can do about this, but much like a lot of Republicans, he lied to get the job. And from Bo Berg and Brown at the Washington Post, over the last two decades, Clarence Thomas has reported on required financial disclosure forms that his family received rental income totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars from a firm called Ginger Limited Partnership. But that company, a Nebraska real estate firm, launched in the 80s by his wife and her relatives, has not existed since 2006. That year, the family real estate company was shut down and a separate firm was created. State incorporation records show that. The similarly named firm assumed control of the shuttered company's land leasing business, according to property records. Since that time, however, Thomas has continued to report income from the defunct company between fifty grand and $100,000 a year in recent years. And there's no mention of the new firm, Ginger Holdings, LLC, on the forms. A previously unreported misstatement might be dismissed as a paperwork error, But it's among a series of errors and omissions that Thomas has made on required annual financial disclosure forms over the past several decades. And that's according to a review of those records. Together, they've raised questions about how seriously Thomas views his responsibility to accurately report details about his finances to the public. And I'll be honest here. If you're not being forthcoming in your financial disclosures, it's because you're trying to hide them. Now, Thomas's disclosure history is in the spotlight, as we know, after ProPublica revealed this month that a Texas billionaire took him on lavish vacations and also bought from Thomas and his relatives a Georgia home where his mother lives, a transaction that was not disclosed on the forms. Thomas said in a statement that colleagues he did not name told him he didn't have to report the vacations and that he's always tried to comply with disclosure guidelines. He has not publicly addressed the property transaction, though. In 2011, after the watchdog group Common Cause raised red flags, Thomas updated years of his financial disclosure reports to include employment details for his wife, Jenny Thomas. The justice said at the time he had not understood the filing instructions. He didn't understand the filing instructions, but he is a Supreme Court justice. How can you not understand a form to fill out but be expected to interpret the Constitution. He said at the time he had not understood the forms. It literally says that. And then in 2020, he was forced to revise his disclosure forms after a different watchdog group found that he failed to report reimbursements for trips to speak at two law schools. Now, on Friday, congressional Democrats with oversight of federal courts cited Thomas's apparent pattern of noncompliance with disclosure requirements in calling on the Judicial Conference, that's the policymaking body for federal courts, to refer him to the Attorney General for a criminal investigation into whether he violated federal ethics laws. I'm sorry, but again, if you're not familiar with disclosure laws and you don't know how to fill out forms, you are not fit to be a Supreme Court justice. I've asked legal experts if there's any constitutional provision 
uh, separation of powers issue that would bar the Department of Justice from criminally investigating Thomas, and there is none. I hope the DOJ takes this up. All right, we will be right back with Dr. Munoz. We're going to discuss a battle over labor relations at Loma Linda. The, the, uh, they're actually arguing that because Seventh-day Adventists don't believe or it's against their religion to have a union, that that is why uh, this group of doctors at a Loma Linda medical facility can't unionize. It's an incredible discussion. You don't want to miss it. Stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Are you tired of worrying about body odor ruining your day? Well, say goodbye to that problem with Lumi deodorant. It's a pH balance solution that keeps you feeling fresh and confident no matter where life takes you. Lumi's patented formula uses a combination of natural ingredients and mandelic acid to neutralize odor-causing bacteria, providing all-day protection that you can count on. Plus, Lumi offers a variety of fantastic scents, like clean tangerine, which I love, lavender sage, and toasted coconut that make you smell great without overpowering fragrances. And unlike some deodorants that try to mask odor with fragrance, Lumi is formulated to stop odor before it starts. It's more like a (laughs) pre-odorant. Lumi has been a lifesaver for me. I've tried countless deodorants over the years, but none have been as effective as Lumi. What I love most about it is it's versatile. I can use it anywhere on my body, and it works just as well. One thing that surprised me about Lumi is how gentle it is on my skin. I haven't experienced any irritation or redness since I started using it. And overall, I would highly recommend Lumi to anyone looking for a natural, effective, and gentle deodorant. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code DAILYBEANS, all one word, at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. That's a $5 discount off the Lumi starter pack or over 40% off when you go to lumi, L-U-M-E, deodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. So resident physicians at Loma Linda University Medical Center here in California filed to unionize in February, the Union of American Physicians and Dentists. But the Loma Linda lawyers for the school are arguing that resident physicians are actually students and therefore somehow exempt from the National Labor Relations Board protections, protections under the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, They are also suing the National Labor Relations Board under religious freedom concerns. That's what they're saying. They're saying Seventh-day Adventists, it's against their religion to unionize. So here to discuss is one of the organizing committee's members for the effort to unionize the resident doctors at Loma Linda, and that is Dr. Jessica Munoz. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Very excited to talk to you about all of this. Dr. Munoz, this is, okay. So I, <laughs> I read the lawsuit, right, or the, the, the motions to dismiss the, the, you know, your, your attempts to unionize. And there were two case citations that the religious folks at Loma Linda, oh, what are they, what are they called? The Loma Linda? Loma Linda University Health Education Consortium is what the full title is. We can just say LUHEC for short, <laughs> but that's... LUHEC. Yes. Got it. Yeah. L-L-U-H-E-C, LUHEC. Okay. So the two cases they cited, which I went and looked up, are the the Catholic bishop case and the University of Great Falls case. And both of those cases were about teachers unionizing at religious institutions. The first one, two high schools. The second one, a university, uh, Great Falls. But here, Lou Heck is arguing that, first of all, your students and not physicians at a medical center... And second, I was confused by them citing those cases. It doesn't seem like relevant case law because you're not teachers trying to unionize. Can you talk a little bit about that and a little bit about the efforts that you've gone through? I mean, it's been it's been a lot trying to, you know, get your unions together and and get rights under the union protected by the National Labor Relations Board. Yeah, it's definitely been a battle over here. You know, most institutions will just let their folks union have a vote and go ahead and see if they can unionize. And so it's it's quite interesting because we have, obviously we're physicians, we graduated from medical school. I have a W-2 and students cannot do the things that I can. 
And so for them to call a student something that the federal court ruled about 25 years ago, that we are physicians and that we are protected under the NLRB, it's very frustrating and it's very sad, you know, like how far our institution will go to just not even let us voice our our vote. And it's very unfortunate. It's very disappointing. The fact that they're also calling us missionaries. So I I'm not SDA myself where when I when I interviewed here, I made sure that religion wasn't going to play a role in my everyday job. And they said no. And so for them to now hear these things, to say these things and to, you know, file a lawsuit, it's it's I'm just I'm heartbroken to see that this is how far they will go. And there are many physicians at our institution that are also not SDA who are residents. And those cases that you mentioned, there we're a healthcare institution at Loma Linda. And all the residents here are protected by the ACGME, which is the accreditation for graduate medical education in the country. And they literally have a statement that says that whatever institutions where residents are, they will not discriminate against religion. And for you to try to force your religion onto us, it's you know, it's like, it's interesting. It's pretty ironic, right? You're trying to fight (laughs) that for religious reasons, um, we can't have a union when you're also trying to impose your religious beliefs onto all of us. And we don't even have a choice where we end up. There's a ranking that happens when you are a physician trying to go into a program to train. And so you're also forcing all these things on individuals who didn't say, I want to go to LUHEC as my number one choice. And again, we're a healthcare institution. Those, those lawsuits or those examples of lawsuits that they mentioned, the cases, they're irrelevant to us because we're a healthcare institution and we're employees and not missionaries. Uh, so that's, that's mm. kind of where we're at there. And the case was dismissed on April 11th mm. because, you know, the, the district court of the district of Columbia said, that, you know, there's no jurisdiction over this um, and that we'll continue with our Region 31 fight uh, and see what the decision will be. And hopefully they just let us continue with our vote like any other institution does and we can move on. And I know we're going to win once we get the vote to happen. Yeah, I I think you will, too. And and even even if somehow the court were able to find or Lou Heck were able to prove that you were students, the two cases that they cited have nothing to do with students unionizing. They have to do with teachers unionizing. And you're not doing either of those. And so I are, you know, attempting to do either of those. So I don't get it. But beyond that bigger picture, I don't even understand how we got the the decisions in Bishop and Great Falls, because how can, you know, you saying that unions are against your religion be a a pretext for disallowing someone to form a union. I mean, yes. what about religions that believe in unions? And what about, you know, like, it just seems uh, odd to me, like you just said, to impose your religious beliefs on others who might not have the same belief. Kind of like how uh, Judaism uh, believes in a woman's right to choose, but we're using Christianity as a precept to foreclose upon your right to choose. It's like, why do you get to pick which religion is correct here? So I don't even get the decisions in Great Falls and Bishop, to be honest. But even if they were like reasonable, they still have no application here for you and and the doctors that are trying to unionize at Loma Linda. Yeah. I mean, this is about labor rights and there are Seventh-day Adventist institutions with unions. And there's currently one, you know, waiting for a vote in California. And so again, it's like, why are we doing this? Because at the end of the day, I've done some research on the SDA religion and their views on the union, because I really wanted to figure out like, why are we doing this? And, you know, Ellen G. White is like one of their founders who is like very against the union because of the things that were happening 50 years ago you know, um, and some of the issues with the union, but it's like, okay, all we're asking for here, why we want a union is because we want to improve the working conditions at Loma Linda. We want to hold the administration accountable for everything that's happening. I mean, they created a billion dollar hospital without rooms for residents to sleep in. And I'm seeing so many patients in the hallways. We don't have enough nurses there are almost every large academic institution in California is already unionized. 
And so it's just so ridiculous that they won't let let us unionize. There are so many hospitals that give their residents free meals every day because most of us work an average of 80 hours, sometimes a lot more than 80 hours, and they get free meals. We don't. I don't even get free meals. We get a free meal if you work more than 24 hours. You know, and that's just a basic thing that we're asking for. Like, hey, we just want some free food. If you're going to make me work 80 hours a week when I don't have time to sleep and I don't have time to cook or go to the store, do things that are human, then at the very least provide some food for me. And so that kind of brings me into like some of the things that we want to fight for, what we want to demand. I think the biggest thing is respect and dignity, right? We want to feel like our institution cares about us because currently so many of so many residents were requesting for some of the things I already mentioned, like a call room. And they were asking us to use the call room in the old hospital. I mean, who's going to go to the old hospital when you are going to get like urgent demands from your nurses to go and see your acute patients? I think that's ridiculous. We've even had full trained attending physicians sleeping on the floor. And so, you know, I myself have never had to do that. But the reason why I am so big on fighting for this is because everyone deserves better. Our nurses, our ancillary support, everyone at this hospital deserves better. And I think a union is the only way that resident physicians will be able to hold Loma Linda accountable. When Loma Linda found out that we were trying to unionize a few years ago, they shut it down. They spent thousands of dollars on anti-union busting companies, you know, instead of saying, how about we try to help these residents? And then they heard a, heard about us filing someone, um, they got word of it, and then they offered $6 million to the resident physicians. And it's very obvious that they're trying to buy us off, but guess what? You're not going to, we're not mm-hmm. going to let you win. We're in it because there's too many things happening at this institution that need to be brought to the surface and to the light. Physician suicides. When I moved, when I started my residency program almost two years ago, I found out that there were multiple resident physician suicides. And it was in that moment that I knew I was going to do something about it. And this is what that is. It's it's unionizing because, you know, people are tired. They're disrespected. They are working. They're so overworked that they're, they're, that cracking moment is, is, is suicide. You know, so many depression uh, rates and diagnoses. I've talked to so many different residents who've disclosed to me. I, I had a press conference when I talked about the suicides and then And about two weeks later, I had someone disclose to me that they were suicidal, that they actually were taking a leave of absence from Loma Linda because of how burnt out they felt. And enough is enough. You know, they need to just, something needs to happen and the community needs to know what's going on. The patients deserve better because if we're treated better, I am sure that I will be able to be more empathetic and deliver better patient care and have better patient outcomes. Yeah. And I mean, has ever has anyone ever just put the actual cost of not unionizing in front of uh, these folks? I mean, if you talk about the money they spend on union busting, the money they spend on lawyers trying to prevent the unions, the money they have to spend retraining physicians because of burnout, dropout, churn and suicide, like you said, the money that they have to spend on malpractice lawyers because of stuff that happens, you know, because of medical outcomes, because folks are burnt out. Has anyone actually put that cost in front of them and said, this is what you're spending to not treat us with respect? And it would be far cheaper for you to treat us with respect and give us a free effing meal every once in a while and put a a call room in and, you know, maybe not work us a hire a couple more folks so that we don't have to work 80 hours a week or 24 hours just to get some food. I'm wondering if anyone's put that cost savings in front because I just I just interviewed last week somebody who was working to unionize a Starbucks store and the millions and millions of dollars it costs to not have a union in place a far outweigh the cost not just in money but in patient lives doctors lives physicians well-being mm-hmm. has anybody actually just done like here is the cost here's what it costs you to be an a-hole <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, the thing is that these institutions, you know, they're the people making the decisions who aren't even doctors of how to run the hospital. I'm like, I want to, I want you to come to bedside and try to do what I do, what all of us are doing with your broken system, but they, they want the power. This is about power and it's about long-term money, right? Because 
it's cheaper for them in the short term of like, let me crack this anti-union, this union thing down, as opposed to let me respect my employees for the rest of <laughs> however long they work here. We are losing doctors at Loma Linda. People are quitting because guess what? They get treated better. They get more respect at other places. And that's where they're going to go, you know? And that's another issue where like, I, you know, don't we want to have an institution that values the people that are already working there and know the system? Let's treat them better. And like you said, like, why are you spending so much money when you could just try to respect your employees a little bit, you know? It would literally save you so much money. Yeah. At at the very end, it's like, hey, you want the people that know your system and make them feel valued. They'll stick around longer and we'll all be more whole Mm -hmm. if we do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that churn is is real. And that's why I, you know, I've so long supported. I worked at the Department of Veterans Affairs for a long time. We so supported the nurses unions because, the, you know, there's in with physicians, residents and nurses and uh, physicians, PAs and uh, nurse practitioners. There's so much. Bur- if, the, if if burnout is allowed to happen, you have to replace and retrain that person at a much more, at big, you know, larger expense to you than to maybe work them, you know, three quarters of the time, give them a meal, a place to sleep if they're on call and keep them on board. It, it just, it makes absolutely uh, no sense to me. So talk to me a little bit. We know about the reasons that you wanted to unionize and the, the things that you're seeing there. Talk also about, uh, because I know a lot of us work at and have worked at patient-centered care facilities and the patient-centered care is very specific and important to us. Mm-hmm. Talk about the cost to the patients. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, when you have large corporations that just want to treat their employees like, like robots, they just keep making you do more and see more and you feel this pressure, right? So because we don't have enough physicians, enough nurses, who are the people that suffer? It's not just us. It's our patients, right? Because they're the ones waiting in the waiting room for six, seven hours. They're the ones whose lab results are taking two, three times as long because people are not they're not hiring more phlebotomists. They're not hiring more nurses. And so- And the pharmacists, right? You got to wait the two hours at the pharmacy, right? Exactly. Everything takes longer when you have a system that is greedy and only focuses on the money, how to save costs, because at the end of the day, what does that turn into? Patient outcomes that are just worsening by the day, by the hour, by the minute. And- even when I, I even know when I was even like not a doctor or when I was a waitress, I know that the we called it turn and burn. The more tables and customers you get, the more money you make. Yeah. Uh, and the faster they're served, the happier they are and the more money you make. So exactly. all of this waiting, when you could see 10 patients instead of just four because you're understaffed, you are going to see an increase in revenue of 60%. Like, I just don't get how much. Add that to the sheet showing them how much it costs them to not let you unionize, but all of the patients that are not getting treatment that can't be seen, the backlog there. And, you know, not to mention just because I'm always like, force them to look at the money because the money is all they care about. Yes. <laughs> for, for for me, it's like, of course, we want the, everybody to be happy. We want a good live work, life work balance. We want patients to be treated well, but they, they don't seem to like to listen to that shit. So I'm just like, show them the yeah, money. Show them the money then. <laughs> like, you know, if we can safely see more patients, you hire more people, like we'll get you more money. (laughs) You know, things, people will be a lot more satisfied with your emergency room visits and their overall stay in the hospital. If you provide what they need and they'll, they'll keep coming. If they feel like you're actually giving them the type of respect and care that they deserve. Yeah. So if we can't convince them with, you know, being good to patients and being good to employees and, we uh, you know, convince them with the bottom line, because both suffer in, in like obviously and clearly uh, without uh, the unions in place. And so I just don't understand why they I mean, I get why they say they oppose it. And I, I, I understand their underlying agenda. I just don't get how anybody benefits. So. Everybody, so this is so cool that this that these were dismissed on April 11th. But I'm pretty sure they'll probably appeal. Oh yes, um, yeah, we're ready for it because there's <laughs> why wouldn't I, why wouldn't they? You know, <laughs> they've already spent this much money. Might yes. as well keep yeah. blowing money and on that instead of paying you guys for a you know proper lunch. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> tell tell me how people can follow you and this 
a fight at, so that they can keep apprised of, of what's going on and, and how they can support you or yeah. your efforts? Yeah, no, we want everyone to to know what's going on. Um, it's been a long time since somebody sued the NLRB. This is huge. I mean, whatever comes out of this case, it's going to impact labor across the country. Anything associated with religion, students, I mean, this people need to be aware of what's going on. And so we have a Twitter page, uh, UAPD Loma Linda, that people can follow because we're consistently updating uh, updating everything on there. Our website is also on there. We are having a press conference in the city of Los Angeles and the city council April 27th at 11 in the morning. If anyone wants to join, come out, support our cause. We'll be talking about mental health. May is Mental Health, mental health Awareness Month. And on May 4th, we are actually, our UAPD is hosting a screening of Do No Harm, which highlights suicides across the country. Loma Linda is actually in this documentary. They tried showing this a few years back when the the suicides were happening and Loma Linda said, absolutely not. You will not show this here. So we want people to come out on May 4th. Our Twitter will have some of these uh, more information on where this will be, what time. And we just want people to, you know, email us, message us. If you want to support us, we can let you know how. Right now, it's all about creating that momentum to get people aware of what's going on to support us. We want politicians to also get involved. I've been meeting with a few of them uh, locally in California to get their support as well, because this is, you know, it is about physicians, but it's ultimately about our patients, the people who live there, their constituents, their safety, their health care. And so I would say those those are the big, big things right now. And hopefully people can get on board and we can get more and more support not just locally, but nationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not just physicians, not just patients, but also at the heart of it, unions and workers' rights. Yes, we actually just found out um, two days ago that there was a nurse who was a traveler nurse at Loma Linda who was speaking about, oh, a union would be a good thing. And then, you know, all of a sudden the next day her contract uh, was not, you know, they they didn't continue her contract. And so these these things are scary, right? People are scared that they're going to lose their job. They're trying to... There's a lot of scare tactics here. And I want to remind people that legally, you're in your legal right to unionize. You should not be scared. There's so many residents that have already signed a card and they're in support, but they're afraid to come up in public because they're scared they're not going to get hired by Loma Linda or that something else will happen. So also just reminding people that you shouldn't be scared, you know, and and that's why I'm doing this because. I'm not scared. I'm ready to fight. I'm going to fight like hell. So yeah. And the law should protect against that kind of retaliation as well. I hope she, I hope she sues the shit out of them. For, for yeah, taking I, a I contract. was like, Hey, here's my lawyer's information. This is not okay. I'm going to fight yeah, together. No. I want the nurses to unionize that Loma Linda is aware of that. They know that once residents unionize, the entire system is going to demand a voice. And that is what they're so scared of. Hundred percent, and 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 again, they shouldn't be scared. It ends up making them more money in the long run, and they don't have to do all this legal stuff. Exactly. I, I, I still just I don't know. I just don't. I guess I I don't have a cold, dead enough heart to understand wanting to cling onto that kind of power at the expense of everyone and everything. So yeah, it's so sad. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Munoz, for joining us, and uh, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the efforts that you're that you're undertaking to to ensure you know, workers' rights and, and and good care for your patients. And I look forward to people coming out on uh, May the 4th and April 27th to support you too. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. A good night's sleep is crucial for well-being, but finding the right mattress can be a challenge. Luckily, Helix Sleep offers personalized mattresses tailored to individual sleep preferences. Their innovative approach has transformed my sleep, and I'm excited to share my experience with you. Sleep is like my one of my favorite things in the world. All you have to do is go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they will match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. After taking the Helix sleep quiz, I was recommended the Helix Midnight Mattress. I am a side sleeper, and the medium firmness of the mattress gives me the ideal balance for comfort and support. And since I started using it, I wake up feeling refreshed and energized more than ever before. At Helix Sleep, they recognize everyone has unique sleep needs, and they offer a range of personalized sleep solutions to meet them. Whether you prefer a soft, medium, or firm bed, uh, or require Helix Plus for plus-size sleepers, they even have a Helix mattress for kids, Helix has you covered. Once you've completed the Helix Sleep Quiz and received your personalized mattress recommendation, place your order. It'll be shipped directly to your home, free of charge. There's a 100-night risk-free trial and a warranty that lasts between 10 to 15 years, and you can rest easy knowing your investment is protected. 
Helix Sleep even offers free pickup and hassle-free returns, ensuring your satisfaction with purchase. Sleep better and worry less with Helix Sleep. And I'm not the only one singing their praises. In 2021, Wired Magazine awarded them Best Overall Mattress, and they won Favorite Mattress last year at the GQ Home Awards. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans and use promo code HELIXPARTNER, all one word. That's their best offer yet. It won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, you want to play What the Mutt with us, uh, if you have uh, a shout out to, you want to give to somebody that you love or a cool business in your area, or if you're a maker or creator and you want to give a shout out to your business, you can send it to us. Uh, also, if you don't have pod pet tax to pay us with photos of your pets, you can suggest an adoptable pet in your area. How, however you want to get your information, your good news to us, you can send it to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. First up from Ann Anonymous. Haha, <laughs> pronoun she and her. I would like to share about a one-of-a-kind heart, Sarah, who has more than taken on saving all dogs in our country. She has loved them and tirelessly provided for them. Proving that life has nothing to do with fair, she lost her two loves, her beautiful pity, Layla, who could magically calm any canine in distress, and her gentle fiancé, who shared Sarah's love of nature and all living things. There are currently 10 beautiful dogs at Adopt a Dog in eastern Indiana who need a loving home, including Tater. Go to Pet Finder in this area or support your local shelter and adopt these dear creatures. Sarah found us our precious Rusty, what the mutt, at a nearby shelter, warning us that this small pup would not be there long. My hub took off work and adopted him that day. Best decision ever. Here are pictures of magical Layla mentoring two other dogs, Tater, available, and Rusty, our little pup. Look at Rusty. Oh, so adorable. If Rusty is the little smaller one, this looks like kind of a corgi sort of terrier um, chihuahua mix. Absolutely beautiful. Look at these babies. Oh, and then there's the little kind of Bichon multi-poo baby. <laughs> these are so cute. Thank you, Anne Anonymous, for sending these in. Adopt a dog in eastern Indiana, everybody. All right, next up, Lottie Miss Claudie, pronouns she and her. Indigo Girl has been asking me to submit her photo for What the Mutt. She is not a purebred and would like to hear her name on the Daily Beans. I explained that she may not be eligible, but that made her unhappy. And if Indigo ain't happy, well, let's just say it's best to keep her happy. So I told her I would try, and here is this beautiful horse. Okay. I'm not very good with a horse breeds, even though I love horses. I don't see any Arabian here because there's no dish nose. Maybe Morgan and Thoroughbred? Um, that would be my guess. Beautiful part. Maybe some Clydesdale. Because I can't tell how tall this horse is. I don't know how many hands this horse is, but let's see. We've got Indigo is half Thoroughbred and half Canadian Draft. All right, I got the Thoroughbred part right. I bought her to do dressage, but dressage bores her. And a boring indigo is almost as dangerous as making her unhappy. What she really likes is jumping. And so at the ripe old age of 65, we are both learning to jump. She is progressing faster than me, but I'm proud to report. I almost always keep my eyes open when we jump now and often to remember to breathe too. We enjoy our daily beans. For some reason, it really motivates me when I need to do housekeeping or horsekeeping. Well, thank you so much for sending in this beautiful, beautiful horse pictures. Indigo. Indigo girl. Very good. Closer to fine. All right. Next up from Kimberly, no pronouns given. Just a quick note to comment on the times we're living through. Shireen Mitchell at Digital Sista coined the term ACRE, ACRE, which stands for Anti-Civil Rights Era. The term fits perfectly as the 1% push for stripping every identity of their rights. Here's my first attempt at a painting as tax, a portrait of my pup, 80 and a photo of how she is now. Wow, this is beautiful. Yeah, look, looks just like her. Oh, so adorable. I love the purple color too. Oh, look at that face. So adorbs. Thanks for sending that in and thanks for making that comment. I appreciate that. Next up from anonymous pronouns, he and him. Hey, Allison. Nebraska hasn't passed a single bill this session thanks to filibusters over trans rights. Hmm. 
This particular bit isn't really new, but the fact that it's continuing is remarkable. State Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, yes, is still filibustering Nebraska's attempt to legislate hate like an absolute champ. Others are joining her effort to grind the session to a halt, including my own state senator, Carol Blood. Here are some pet tax, me and my dog. Oh, <laughs> look at the little doxy. And you look real comfy. Um, I, I, w- I want to be that tired. Thank you so much for that. Pronouns he and him. Next up, Betsy, pronouns she and her. AG, DG, guest hosts. I love y'all. Thanks for keeping me informed and laughing every morning. Thursday was my birthday. Happy birthday, Betsy. And I can now proudly say that my quilling art is for sale in a local art gallery. I'm so excited. It's the Voorhees Arts Center Gallery near Cherry Hill. And it's also on my Etsy shop at Betsy Quilling. That's Q-U-I-L-L-I-N-G. If you haven't seen this quilling art from Betsy, it's really, truly incredible. She sent me some art and a a necklace. I wore the necklace out the, the other day. I got so many compliments on it. More good news. After a zillion years, my dad and I will be sharing a home together and he moves up here today. Very exciting. Absolutely incredible. Look at that display. That's beautiful. Congratulations. Oh, and some great close-up photos of the quilling art. Ah, lovely. Congratulations, Betsy. That's so effing cool. And thanks to everybody who submitted good news. Fun playing What the Mutt with horses. If you have a horse and you want me to try to guess its breed, feel free to send it in. I only know like 10 breeds, but Send them in anyway. I'm better with colors and markings and the parts of a horse, <laughs> which I had to memorize when I was uh, learning horsemanship at uh, Girl Scout camp when I was very young. So anyway, anything you want to send to us, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com. Dana comes back tomorrow. Please send in your birthday wishes uh, to the good news so we can give those to her. And again, thanks to Dr. Munoz for all the great work that she's doing in Loma Linda. So anyway, I will see you back here tomorrow. I can't wait for Dana to be here. I miss my Dana. I miss my DG. So uh, tune in. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. At Discount Tire, we know your time is valuable. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online. Did you know Discount Tire now sells wiper blades? Check out our current deals at DiscountTire.com or stop in and talk to an associate today. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. Hi, it's Ted here, the unofficial spokesperson for Consumer Cellular with some very official advice. All right, how do I put this lightly? Your wireless provider is overcharging you. No. Oh. That was easier than I thought it would be. So, get the exact same coverage as the major carriers at half the cost. Switch and save up to $250 a year on all the talk, text, and data you need at ConsumerCellular.com.